you know, I'm trying to cut short applause for her, not her, me, me, I'm here, me, me. <laughs> Sorry. No, but now, seriously, enough of this bad taste joke. I, wo I will begin with precisely one of the aspects of my great appreciation of Jacqueline's work. Uh, I hope all of you did read, it was published when, two, three weeks ago, your wonderful comment in London Review of books about all the racial violence against women implication of that Pistorius trial in South Africa. I find this simply a breathtaking, wonderful text. But uh, I, will, I will just tell you frankly in what way I intend to cheat. The original plan was today Brandon Hegel, tomorrow tomorrow uh, Schiller, aesthetics, and the last days more theology and so on, or politics, it doesn't matter. I decided nonetheless in view of all these latest political events and so on to do today mostly some political comments, reactions, reflections, and then move towards death drive, a little bit of my new variations on my internal, eternal, sorry, topic, Lacan Hegel. Then, tomorrow, it's the boring part, but I love it. It's, uh, you know who is Robert Brandom, the high priest of this so-called Pittsburgh Hegelians. It's basically analytic philosophy, Habermasian way to try to redeem Hegel. And what I will comment is a book, and this is very generous of Brandom, that he made available on the web for free. It's a book, detailed commentary of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. While I deeply appreciate his works, it's a wonderful piece of consequent thinking and so on and so on, I nonetheless think that it, how should I put it, misses the point of Hegel. That's a kind of gentrification, domest domestication of Hegel. For example, and I like this example, uh, you know, uh, I'm now probably repeating myself, I mentioned this here, something interesting is happening with Hegel in the last decades. Till around, I would say, 20, maybe 30 years ago, there were two Hegels. The conservative Hegel embodied mostly in the British tradition uh, uh, around 1900 and so on, Hegel as kind of a warning against the, the too much liberal freedom of uh, bourgeois society, this conservative proto-fascist Hegel, and the leftist revolutionary Hegel. Liberals were mostly against Hegel, dismissing him either as a dangerous nihilist or as a dangerous uh, totalitarian. By liberals, I mean, of course, Karl Popper, but not only him, for whom, again, Hegel is the proverbial bad guy. Uh, what is happening in the last decades is that precisely this, let's call it with an irony, of course, third way Hegel, Hegel, who is neither conservative nor revolutionary, is almost occupying the leading place in at least Western academic debates. The liberal Hegel, and as I developed in my books, two aspects of this, like now, now I'm giving you the shibboleth or the, to feed your Stalinist instincts, how do you recognize these enemies? No? <laughs> it's two features. The first one is the, uh, the uh, much more modest reading of Hegel. The idea is forget about Hegelian ontology, metaphysics, and so on. What Hegel is doing is simply to providing a kind of a general epist like epistemolo epistemology or description of all, all possible ways of rational argumentation. Like, and forget about ontology, theology, and so on. It's simply methodological Hegel. Hegel as a general general discursive theorist. All possible modes of argumentation, all possible modes we can describe the world. Uh, the other aspect is, uh, 
and here you recognize liberal Hegelians, recognition. Hegel is perceived, and that's the liberal reading of Hegel, as the one who pursues in his political work, but not only there, the idea of full mutual recognition. Freedom means mutual recognition. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of you know better and you should correct me. But I find it so interesting that there are a couple of crucial places where you may disagree or disagree with Hegel, but where he clearly and in a central way refers to recognition, but again in a weird, unpleasant way. And none of these guys mentions this. Like, the whole Hegelian argument for, in defense of death penalty, is based on recognition. Hegel's crazy idea is that by death penalty, you treat the accused, the condemned, you recognize him or her as a full human being, responsible. Hegel's idea is that if you prohibit death penalty, then you are not really recognizing the murderer, because you are treating him not as an autonomous agent, but as a victim of circumstances, and so on and so on. Now, there are... I will, okay, I will not enter into, do I agree here with Hegel or not? I'm just saying that there is maybe one thing which moderately works for Hegel, which is that it's interesting to note how many regimes which prohibited death penalty did continue to execute people, but just renaming it, like even October Revolution is not clear here. One of the first things that October Revolution did is, of course, abolish death penalty. Then, uh, immediately in 1919, in the civil war, they caught some white counter-revolutionary generals, they shot them. And all the Western liberals were enraged. But didn't you abolish that penalty? How can you do this? Uh, the answer of Soviet Union, sorry, this is my Stalinist pleasure, I like, it was a wonderful one. But this wasn't a death penalty, it was just preventive measure. Like, it has nothing to do with death penalty and so on. It was, or they claim, educational measure, but... That don't, uh, what I was saying is that, you know, this is a model of what, for this liberal reading of Hegel to work, how much you lose. About this tomorrow, and the last day, I think, you know, the problem with Schiller is, okay, maybe I already even mentioned this the last time that I was here. Schiller interests me because he ended up as a proto-fascist. I think, although I don't totally agree with him, with Jean-Luc Nancy, or it was the other guy, they were friends, uh, Philippe Lacoula Bart, that uh, one of the, at least, intellectual origins of fascism is aestheticization of politics. You know, for example, you find it directly in his famous letter to Furtwängler. Furtwängler, you know, the great conductor, national conservative, but nonetheless more or less an honest guy. And I cannot resist improvising on this. Uh, like, uh, it's so unjust history, how whenever people say classical music conducting and Nazism, they mention Furtwängler. Wait a minute, why not Karajan, who was an infinitely worse guy? Karajan was a member of the Nazi party. He used his influence to denounce other people and so on. Furtwängler was a kind of honest conservative who did the thing. He stepped down in 34. He tried, he thought that he will be able with his influence to save the Jews, even in Berliner Philharmonic. When it didn't work, he stepped down and he remained the symbol. It's the same in literature, maybe even with the twist of anti feminism at the end of German Democratic Republic. Two of their greatest writers, icons, were Christa Wolf and uh, Heiner Miller. Heiner Miller was much more involved with Stasi, but to him everything was pardoned. While they only caught Christa Wolf writing for half a year some reports, she had to, but everything was rendered public. And it's clear that she, she denounced no one. Her reports were so useless that after half a year, the Stasi simply stopped any pressure on her. No, it ruined her chances of Nobel Prize. Everyone knows this. Like, 
while Heiner Miller, you know, with his daring masculine arrogance, uh, did it. But what I, back to this, why is Schiller interesting? Because he is nonetheless a great writer, and at the end comes, you should read it. You find very smooth English translation simply on the web. Uh, uh, the, the song on the bell is the translation. Gesang, Lied von Glocke, whatever. It's uh, the best short poetic resume of fascism that I know. It describes an ideal patriarchal society which is clearly based on sexual division. You know, all these men, one man goes around to bring spoils, to conquer foreign countries, woman stays at home, take care of home, everything is nice. Then people go crazy, French Revolution, and he openly refers, there is no doubt, to French Revolution, because he says, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and uh, the mob goes crazy, everything goes wrong. But it's very interesting that he, Schiller, blames women, as if the source of French Revolution was that women no longer were satisfied with their role of properly staying at home, taking care there, but become a wonderful title, Laughing Hyenas. And then, finally, men re-establish their authority, and then comes the bell. Because then you have a long proto-fascist description of the production of a bell, of a big church bell, and how this brings people together. It's pure aesthetization of politics, this feeling of community, and everything is in order again. No wonder that this song Although it's strange to imagine why Schiller was at the same time celebrated as the great poet of freedom. But from Schiller's time, through Bismarck Germany, through the Nazi times, in a strange way, even in German Democratic Republic, this song was celebrated as the ultimate of German attitude. And I am glad to tell you that I think that when Schiller speaks about, blames all the misfortunes of French Revolution on crazy women, and women, the definition of a crazy woman is the woman who is no longer controlled by benevolent paternal authority. They run amok, and they laugh like crazy. And I think I identified maybe the model of this madness. It's, of course, my beloved uh, Caroline von Schlegel, who later married uh, Schelling. She was pretty much to the left Jacobin, and uh, she reports in one of her letters that when she and her friends were reading this poem by Schiller, they had to laugh so much that they fell on <laughs> down from their chair and so on. It was absolutely a primordial hatred between of them. But what I'm telling you is this. Uh, I think that that lecture on Schiller that I planned for tomorrow works only with, if you were to know the texts. Because what is so interesting is how Schiller arrived at this point. His proto-fascism was a conclusion, and in this way he tried to resolve some deadlocks. But since he is nonetheless a great writer, these deadlocks are very interesting. Like, if you want to do more Schiller, read it. You can get it. Very good translation, free on the web. His play, Don Carlos, where you have something extraordinary happening, which is, I think, crucial for the genesis of fascism. A weak king broken down, and at the end, this wonderful figure of the great inquisitor. Blind man who controls everything, he is this post-traditional authority. Enters and forces the king to sacrifice his son and so on and so on. I think it's a crucial moment in defining what happens with authority in early modern society, how but, uh, standard patriarchal authority is replaced with another type of authority. And then you can show it in a nice way how, out of all these deadlocks, the only way open to Schiller was uh, 
was kind of a proto-fascist vision of aestheticized, uh, of aestheticized politics. Because what's so weird is that Schiller's first mega hit play, Roberts, the Reubern, there it's on the contrary male bonding which is blamed. You know, Karl Moore, the hero, uh, establishes a group of robbers who are fighting, they want a social revolution, and in this way he betrays his love. The woman, so the woman is on the side of family and order, and the origin of revolutionary terror is male bonding not controlled by feminine feminine gentleness, uh, uh, sympathy, and so on, humility, and so on. But how did he come? That was interest me. From here to, to uh, the lead on the, uh, the song on the bell, where, again, it's women as laughing hyenas who are the source of evil. It's a wonderful line. So, but again, for this to work, you have to read the text. So what I will do then uh, on the last day, now, two days from now on Friday, after going in detail tomorrow through Brandom, don't be too afraid because I will be talking about very concrete things, analysis which even refer to our experience and so on. And my point is Precise, because you know why I'm so traumatized by Brandon? Because basically I find attractive what he is doing. What he is doing is, in a way, what I sometimes try to do it. To show, in the terms of our common sense reasoning, how Hegel makes sense. He wants to break out of the Hegelian jargon. But I think he sacrifices too much. The Hegel that we get there, it's a Hegel where what is really crazy, subversive in Hegel, disappears. So, this tomorrow, and then, uh, and then uh, the last day, I will do something on theology and politics, some new stuff, which will reflect on what will happen, but it's a failed event, I must inform you, I'm a pessimist. Directly from here on Saturday, I fly to Tel Aviv, I go to Ramallah, the alternate uh, Walter Benjamin conference. But it didn't turn out. Most of the people who promised to be there uh, cancelled in the last minute. And uh, there is a, a very sad tension which makes me depressive here at work. Namely, Palestinians, some of them, I respect their wish, wanted to do just another political event, protesting Israeli oppression and so on. While I totally agree with it, because what is happening now in Israel is like, it's simply, you know, if you think that Arabs are religious fundamentalists, where? Go to Israel. I mean, like recently I read that Three ministers in Netanyahu government now openly declare that we should stop this game of two-state solution, West Bank is ours. Why? Because it says so in the Bible. I mean, are we aware what they are saying? Like, if this is not religious fundamentalism, then I don't know what religious fundamentalism uh, means. And then you have other, did you read about these moments, crazy statements? I almost like them when Netanyahu recently said in an interview that uh, it wasn't really Hitler who is responsible of the Holocaust, that Hitler just, it's serious, it's not a joke, that Hitler just wanted to throw the Jews out. But that uh, Mufti Husseini, whatever, the leader of Palestinians, who effectively met Hitler, but not at that point, a little bit later, Netanyahu treats, but nonetheless, that's Netanyahu's stories, was afraid that throwing the Jews out meant this is, uh, that they will come to Palestina. So the story, totally invented, is that Netanyahu told, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Hitler told to uh, Husseini, I want to throw Jews out, then Husseini 
told him, okay, but where will they go? To us, to Palestina. And that Hitler replied, okay, but what should they do with the Jews? And then that Husseini said, burn them. And that this gave to Netanyahu the idea of, sorry, to, to, uh, to Hitler, <laughs> the idea of, but what I like so much, and here you get the good side of my Jewish friends. My leftist Jewish friends then invented a whole series of stories bringing this logic to the end, and I love it. Like, one of them claimed that they discovered some new manuscripts, ancient, of course, with some illustrations, where it's clear that when Pontius Pilatus condemns Christ to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to death, that there is a figure like Mohammed whispering to Pontius Pilatus this, you know that, like, already there, not the Jews, the, the, the Muslims, proto-Muslims, they didn't yet exist, were there, and so on. No, the situation is, uh, is, uh, the situation is really tragic, because as a reaction to this then, because this conference was supposed to take place at Birzeit University in Ramallah, Part of it will, but unfortunately, I'm really sad about this. As a reaction to the renewed Israeli violence, the Birzeit University gave a hint at organizers that Israeli Jews will not be allowed to enter the university. Now, I find this crazy and I understand it, but I find it very sad. For example, my friend Udi Aloni, was prohibited to enter, to enter the university there. And even, I maybe already mentioned it here, it's, there is an even sadder, much more sad event taking place there where, uh, I will try to, no, okay, not now, but when uh, uh, Udi Aloni, maybe I will tell you this story, now it's all confirmed, organized uh, concert in, I think, at Columbia or at several places of a Palestinian rapper, singer, very popular, who also plays a central role in Udi's new film. And this singer did a song on criticizing honor killings among Palestinians. And this singer and Udi were attacked by allegedly hardline Western leftists at Columbia, that why mention this? This means supporting uh, Zionism. In the sense of, uh, you know, if honor killings happen there, they are in reality the effect of Zionist occupation. We shouldn't talk about this now, and so on, and so on. And of course, the singer was shocked because he was accused of not mentioning, ignoring, Israeli occupation and Udi. But this is madness, I'm sorry. These two guys were arrested a couple of times by Israeli police. They're doing nothing but this. And what, instead of us being glad that with regard to honor killings, we are not doing our Western patronizing thing, you know, primitive Palestinians. No, they have already their own fight. And these are the same people who also fight uh, 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 Israeli pressure and so on. We should be glad about it. No, when you get such things, and now I will go even more into pessimism. Sorry, I cannot avoid this comment. For example, I think a big catastrophe political happened a couple of days ago. You saw the news. I don't know how widely it was reported here in the UK. But I think it's one of the greatest ethico-political catastrophes of Europe. European Union made a deal with Turkey. Basically, it's pure bribery. It's, we pay you money if you stop the flow of the refugees. The point is that, as my friends immediately noticed, it's almost the, what, uh, what <coughs> Erdogan is doing, the Turkish boss, it's almost the opposite of what Putin is doing. Putin is punishing Europe by, how do you call it, closing, cutting off the flow of, of gas, of uh, turning off the pipe if Europe, if he doesn't like Europe, Erdogan threatens to open the pipe of refugees. And it's pure deal. 
they promised to Erdogan uh, first, as the first installment, 3 billion, uh, 3 billion of euros, then a better treatment in Europe, all of it, just to close off, get rid of the flow of refugees. And then, that's what makes me furious, then they talk about war on terror. You know, the usual reaction to Paris attacks was this uh, left humanism. Uh, oh my God, why war on terror? We cannot just fight terror by terror. This just brings more terror and so on. Okay, there is some element of truth in it. But I plead for a much more radical approach. Oh, it's obvious that they don't mean seriously the war on terror. What war on terror is going on when they tolerate Turkey, which, as everyone knows, is half supporting the Islamic State? And it's not even secret now. Did you notice it was in the newspapers, a small note, that the chief of the Turkish secret police, who is, as if by chance, the brother of Erdogan, already made a public statement claiming that the Islamic State nonetheless expresses the will of the people. International community should, uh, should recognize it, start dialogue, and so on, and so on. And we make a deal with Turkey. It's also clear what Turkey did. Turkey used this pact with the West of fighting the terror, but what they are really bombing the Turks are the Kurds. And the Kurds are the only ones who are really fighting the Islamic State. state. Seriously. So again, I'm much more tempted to play this game, you know. You talk about war on terror while making pact with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, who are discreetly the main supporters of ISIS and so on. Like, what is going on here? It's not, it's just this demonizing of ISIS, but all the conditions, all those who support ISIS are getting a preferential treatment against the only forces which are seriously fighting ISIS. And also, although some people accused me of almost turning a European nationalist and so on, but I am not. I am just for organized reception of refugees precisely to prevent racist hatred and so on. And what is happening now in this way of making these dirty deals with Turkey, I claim, it's a total ethico-political catastrophe. You see, that's the problem. It's not that uh, they are too fanatical, war on war on terror, pushing it too far. No, the problem is they are not taking it seriously. It's madness. You talk about war on terror and then discreetly you make pacts with those who effectively support it. It's all well documented. Although now he denies it publicly, but everybody knows it. My Kurdish friend told me. You know, we find this in the media that uh, ISIS is selling oil and surviving by oil. Sorry, but ISIS, Islamic State, is landlocked. How does it sell oil? How does it come to, to the sea? <laughs> Through Turkey. Everybody knows it, and so on. You know, like, it's, it's, uh, it's such a deep how should I put it, uh, ethical disorientation, you know. And also, this is my problem with the left, that they avoid the difficult questions. For example, I don't know if you already know this story. It was maybe published somewhere. Recently, I gave an interview for Sie Deutsche Zeitung, the German daily, and then at the end, they asked me to answer to some readers' questions. And there was one question which found an incredible echo. Hundreds of people replied to it, agreeing with the guy. It was a simple question. I claim to be democratic. And I support Angela Merkel in that call, you know, refugees, you should come. But isn't it absolutely clear that the majority of Germans are against too many immigrants? So, and the decision to allow immigrants in hundreds of thousands to come in is a serious big decision. Wasn't this a paradigmatic anti-democratic decision? Why didn't, they, why didn't they ask the German people what they want? You know, my answer to this is a very uh, cynical one. It's no, democracy, at least 
if by democracy we mean what we have now, de facto, as the ruling system, should not be the absolute limit. There are situations where you have the right to say fuck democracy, I mean, to impose, to do something in every way possible, even if it goes against the, the will of the majority or whatever and so on and so on. That was, if some of you were stupid enough to listen to that uh, orgy that we had, me, Varoufakis and uh, uh, Assange, that's also my problem with Varoufakis. This guy really believes in democracy, you know. I don't. Like, if you watched it, you noticed where there was a gentle misunderstanding between the two of us. His idea was democratize Europe. How? For example, all the sessions of those mysterious European community bodies, all the sessions should be publicly <coughs> transmitted. Well, she thinks that, what? I think that what if the result were to be even worse if you don't change many other things? Like, for example, I know at least how re what representatives of my state, Slovenia, and some others who play here very bad role will be. Because the majority opinion in most post-communist East European countries is screw the Greeks, we are more poor, why should we help the lazy Greeks? If the negotiations there were to be public, they would have been even more against Greece to please their populist uh, con constituency back in their country. And also Varoufakis' counterpoint was, because my other simple point was, okay, let's say we are that committee which, whose meetings are now secret. Okay. We make it public. It's clear what I would have done. Let's say that I'm the evil guy. I call a discreet private meeting one day before, and we make all the decisions, the majority. Then Varoufakis said, but this is illegal. No, it's not even necessarily illegal. You know what's my point? My point is that people are not a priori good, in the sense of, you know, if you just tell them the truth. No. Ideology is a real hard material practice, to put it like this. It really works in everyday life. My God, all these guys, obviously, they didn't read Marx. Remember what already Marx knew when he says that uh, commodity fetishism remains even if you theoretically totally enlightened it, and so on and so on. You know, this is very interesting because it's the same problem as the one Freud was facing when he discovered that after his early enthusiasm that you can have a perfect interpretation, the patient even pretends at least to accept it, but the symptom persists. Something more has to be done. And it's, uh, it's, the, same, it's the same here. I understand, not agree, I understand Ordinary people, when you take into account how they experience situation and so on. Uh, and that's why, not because I'm in any way against the refugees. I plea for talking, and not because I'm in any way Islamophobic. I think we should talk openly about these things. Because I had a big debate in Berlin two weeks ago, where I was attacked by the idea that, but why do I focus now on women's rights in Muslim society? Now we have the humanitarian problem of thousands of refugees. Can we put this to a later time? I see this as a shortcut to catastrophe. Precisely now we should talk about it. Of course, that's the whole point, not in the racist way. But we should talk about all this openly. And also, of course, also in a way which criticizes us. That is to say, it's not enough to say the way Muslims treat w women predominantly, if it is predominantly, I don't know, it's unacceptable for us. Immediately, one should mention our counterpart, which is at least, okay, maybe not as bad, but yes, it's the same category. Like, if nothing else, Catholic pedophilia in the Catholic Church. We, but about all this, we should talk openly. If not, if we, if we continue this simple, uh, this 
politically correct, left wing, you know, like m the main argument again. Ah, the argument against me, I loved it, were triple, three arguments. The first one was this one. It's not the appropriate moment to talk about this. Uh, I disagree with this, you know why? Because we, I'm, again, my whole point is, of course we are also to blame. We are even ultimately to blame. But uh, there is a tendency going on independently of Islam in the world, which I find very worrying, which is that uh, sexual difference is reasserted, and by sexual difference I mean the subordination of women to men, is re-emerging as the central ethico-political question for some people. And this goes from Putin to Mugabe to others and so on. This is what I find so strange about, for example, a movement like Boko Haram. This should give us to think that you have a movement which really wants to revolutionize society, but the basic premise of this woman is Boko Haram, which vaguely translated, so as told, mean no Western education for women, de facto, meaning. So isn't this something strange? And this brings us even back to Schiller, I mean, no? That the, the basic political question becomes how, and the saddest thing, I know this is false, but that's how it functions, is that, uh, because as some fr you, this may surprise you, but I have even friends in, in, in Nigeria. And they told me what's so tricky about Boko Haram is that their logic is formally an anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist one. They claim imperialism is not just economy, it's also destructive cultural influence. And the basis of this destructive cultural influence is the feminist propaganda, which destroys the natural hierarchy and this way threatens to dissolve all of society. In the same way, similar way, this, the story goes on then to Mugabe, who made recently a speech in United Nations, claiming that gay rights are basically Western colonialist uh, uh, propaganda. And don't jump now too quickly to conclusion. My point is just not here to make fun of primitive Africans or whatever. The point is, of course, that up to a point this is true. I mean, we should not forget what happened, for example, in Iraq, that to their disgrace, many American centrist liberal feminists supported American aggression attack on Iraq, claiming that at least it will liberate women there. And the irony is wonderful, as you probably know. The opposite happened. That is to say, whatever you are saying, and that's the sad thing that is happening, whatever you say about, and I don't like them in any way, uh, Saddam, I don't like it because, you know, we tend to forget that before he was overthrown and a couple of years before, Saddam was de facto the big American ally there. Don't you remember the war against Iran where United States not only provided Iraq with poisonous gases, but even <laughs> provided the Iraqi army with satellite uh, photographs to know where to use. The Americans only protested when Saddam used some gases against his own people, but not when he used them against uh, Iranians. This was for me a mega. Here I agree. I even wrote a couple of years ago a text, which maybe now I would not put it, give Iranian nukes a chance. When I told them, of course, Ir Iranians are traumatized. You remember the war. Iraq, after Khomeini revolution, Saddam thought, okay, now it's a chance, Iran is in chaos, he clearly invaded Iran. I don't remember any Western non-aligned, whichever party, which clearly stated this. All the calls for peace started to arise when Iraq started to lose the war. Then all of a sudden, oh my God, but war is not the solution, and so on, and so on. So what I'm saying is that, uh, no, but whatever we say about Saddam and Assad, they are horror, yes. Do you know that these were the only two Middle East states which were at least formally secular? 
And this meant something, like, as already mentioned it here even, I think, Tariq Aziz, the uh, Saddam's foreign minister, the public face of his regime. He was an Iraqi Christian. You know, it was the main result, social result, of American occupation of Iraq. They dissolved the army, police fell apart, Muslim militias took over public order. So there were under Saddam two million of Christians there, now most of them emigrated, and point to women's role is much more diminished. So this is a wonderful irony. United States, a Christian country in some sense, invades Iraq to liberate women and so on, and the result is exactly the opposite one. Women are more oppressed, plus Christians <coughs> disappear from the country. So again, you know, don't accept, this is for me the beginning of critical thinking, don't accept the terms of the debate, like war on terror. You should always question, but is it really this what is going on? Frankly, I don't know what is going on. I only know that it's definitely not some kind of a simple uh, war on terror. I met yesterday my good friend, I'm mentioning this not to boast, but to remind you that he's still alive because he's slowly getting desperate, Julian Assange, who told me that now again he got some material that they will publish, but nobody cares what now WikiLeaks are publishing, which clearly reconfirms what we already knew for, from some documents that in spite of their official opposition, Israeli and Saudi Arabia representatives are all the time meeting with the task of how, how to contain Iran. So who is fighting whom there? Another thing that worries me is, it's clear now that bombing will not do the job. So they are now trying to organize some independent Sunni forces to occupy that era. There will be some kind of, even if by proxies, military occupation. And then I see even for world peace a great danger. Uh, what will happen then with uh, Assad regime? Will they not be tempted, these independent forces, to move into Assad? What will then the Russians do there? And so on and so on. Again, I think that whatever is going on, it's absolutely not some kind of a simple, now we have an enemy, war on terror, and so on and so on. Even Israel, this is a subtle thing to note how Israel never really unequivocally condemned uh, the Islamic State. There are even some very obscure links with Israel. I mean, this was, I don't know if I already told you this story. This was a big scandal in Israel, you know, when they discovered that uh, Israeli army is basically uh, helping Al-Qaeda. Why? Because in the <coughs> south of Lebanon, the part, one part is called on Israeli border by Al-Qaeda, the other part by, by Hezbollah. And since Israeli fear more Hezbollah, and since Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda are fighting, of course, they are helping Al-Qaeda there. I mean, some Israeli photographer, even, they had shots of how they are giving them arms, treating their wounded, and so on and so on. So again, don't, it's simply that the situation is obscure, who knows what. Absolutely, we should reject the terms of what is happening. The second thing I wanted to say, maybe you know this line, I've written about it, but I don't know where it was published in, in, uh, in English. I think only on the website of Newsweek, which is one of the few still ready to publish me because I'm now prohibited in Guardian and so on and so on. Ah, to be fair, they do invite me still but I don't even reply them, to appear open. But you know with what topics? This kind of a social way of life topic. Like a year ago, I got a letter from, uh, email, from Guardian. <coughs> Professor, would you care to answer the question, why do you wear a beard? How does it help your creativity <laughs> and so on? You know, they, this is a systematic move to this, like, who cares about politics, lifestyle, and so on, and so on, you know. <coughs> okay, but let me go on. So uh, now I'm approaching the topic of violence and so on. My big reaction to this uh, 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 latest Paris 
killing is again. Of course, we condemn them, but but is not that we should understand them and so on. But is uh, that we should really condemn them, not just again use this as a kind of a pathetic spectacle of solidarity of all of us, free democratic civilized people against the murderous Muslim monster or uh, monster or whatever, because ah, I want to tell you this, although it's anecdotic, my God, I hope I'm not losing uh, too much time. Uh, I am, but what the hell. Uh, <laughs> you know that I made a statement apropos Charlie Hebdo killings, where a journalist in my own country, Slovenia, asked me, uh, what do you think about those Paris murders. And okay, I was a little bit fast, but I said, listen, the truly disgusting thing was that photo opportunity. You know, when you had all the world leaders holding hands and hopefully, this is sometimes God is benevolent and allows this. There was a photographer 50 yards behind taking in the whole scene, you know. There was no crowd on the top of which there were all those world leaders. There was simply just leaders and Three, four lines of obviously secret policemen behind them. That's why all the shows were, shots were closed. It was pure photo opportunity. And I said, listen, if you already want to shoot somebody, it would be much better to shoot those politicians there for their hypocrisy. Ah, the Slovenian right-wing press is now systematically for two months attacking me Seriously, this is not a joke, what I will tell you now. Demanding that I be prosecuted for terrorism because they claim, since I call for the murder of those politicians and since Francois Hollande was among them and since Francois Hollande was also on the stadium in Paris, so what the, these latest attacks in Paris are, they just uh, executed my comment. <laughs> so I'm not only justifying them, I even co-organized them. And they are quite serious. They wrote an appeal to Slovene public prosecution, like we already have terrorists in our midst. Why am I not prosecuted? They informed French embassy that France should start, should start proceedings against me for instigating terror. So we live in crazy times, but that's not uh, important. We all knew this. Now, a little bit more serious stuff. What I've written about is, I remember a comment on Slovene TV, TV, which was simple but deeply justified, I claim. After a Paris attack, they asked one of the refugees, what does he think about it? Of course, they want him to join this universal solidarity. And he said something simple, stupidly simple, but very nice. He said, we deeply sympathize with Paris victims, but you see, this is what we are running from. And then he made a nice comment. He said, you see, for you, this is a singular event. Oh, my God, attack. But what for you is a singular event once a year is for us daily life. Now you understand what we are running from. And this brings me to a point I made long ago. Isn't this the first thing that we should note? There are exceptions. I simplify it. But the big difference between the West, we who live under this cupola of human rights, relative welfare, and so on, for us, terrorist attacks are momentary, brutal disruptions of, uh, of, of normal, everyday life. Life goes on, boom. Things explode, then you have solidarity, normal life is gradually established, and so on and so on. But again, the horror of what goes on in many countries outside Europe is that brutal violence is simply a fact of life. It's not an exception. They, this is their daily life. Uh, so I claim that... Uh, we should, the first thing is that we should, when we talk about violence, we should become aware and draw all the consequences from this tension. For us, it's just momentary disruptions, if, even if they are relatively big ones, like September 11th. But nonetheless, life then, 
returns to normal in the sense of, yes, we do the work of mourning, we do all the stuff, but it's over. Like, it's a momentary event. Why? In those countries, many countries, it just goes on. And then from here, we should go on to all the levels of violence that still pervade around the world. For example, and here I want to go to Jacqueline's wonderful text on Pistorius, where she pointed out how Pistorius' killing of his girlfriend has to be read against the complex background of white men's fear of black violence, as well as of the widespread terrible reality of violence against women. A quote from Jacqueline's text. Every four minutes in South Africa, a woman or a girl, often a teenager, sometimes a child, is reported raped. And every eight hours, a woman is killed by her partner. The phenomenon has a name in South Africa, intimate femicide. Or, as the journalist Margie uh, Oxford calls, the repeated killing of women across the country, serial uh, femicide. And the reason I admire Jacqueline's text is that she avoids in a masterful way both wrong procedures here. The one would have been to play the European arrogance, you see, these black people, the moment you give them freedom, they start killing their own women, this hypocritical deploring of the third world violence. And the other, again, the opposite, of course, is to claim that this uh, condemning violence there is just a neo-colonialist game of blaming them and so on and so on. The first thing to bear in mind is, again, the presence of violence also, even although we may appear to live in uh, highly developed uh, 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 countries with even ethical development, uh, uh, women's protection, feminism, and so on and so on, but are we aware what is going on now even in some developed countries? Like recently I learned a terrifying think that maybe some of you read about it. I was told it was a big news there, where there, in Canada. <coughs> a Native American, okay, politically incorrect term, Indian prostitute, was killed by a white customer. The way she was killed is not very unpleasant. She put a long knife into her vagina and started turning around and cutting and so on. Now comes the double scandal. The first part of the scandal, all this was confirmed. Nobody denied this. He was set free. He wasn't. The jury set him free. How? Uh, now comes the horror. It's so depressing. I warn you, it's really depressing. The, uh, the defense did something unheard of. As part of their defense material, they have shown to the jury the torso of the dead woman. Lower part, obviously, they cut it into two of the body up to her knees with all the wounds. I mean, can you imagine how disgusting this was? And what shows an incredible level of anti-feminist racism is how Nobody protested since it was a native woman. You know, it was... And then, can you imagine the absolutely disgusting procedure of the defense lawyer said, you see, here, my customer moved his knife here and so on. It was really this half-rotten lower part of the body there. The defense was that it was all part of a kinky slightly perverted sexual game which ran out of control. That it wasn't a murder, that this customer, that was his defense. I made a deal with her, it was a market contract, that I can softly put a knife into her vagina, she accepted it, and then we started to play, and that I warned her it will be weird sex, so 
even when she started to bleed, I thought it's still part of the contract because that was the disgusting defense because she was well known to accept uh, 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 customers with weird desires. And then the game simply ran out of control, but it was mostly her guilt by provoking me and so on and so on. So you see the horror. I mean, it was absolutely no doubt what happened. Nobody disputed this. And it, it, this is what shocked me. This is for me the most depressive part of this report, that one would have thought that if you show literally part of the body there, a half rotten and so on, you can't imagine cut. I mean, with, sorry, but here I'm an abstract humanist, that with normal people, this should give rise to some kind of sympathy for her. My God, this was once a young, beautiful woman. W look what's, what became of her now. No, it convinced the jury against her. Can you imagine what kind of deeply racist and anti-feminist stance had to be at work there if they were able even to swallow this? the half-rotten feminine torso, and not out of... Because, you know, that's what shocked me. First, when I heard this report, my reaction was that probably prosecution did this to arouse sympathy. Now we will show you, it will be disgusting, but now we will show you uh, what the murderer did it. No, it wasn't. It worked against. Can you imagine what a thick set of anti-feminist and so on, racist, because it's crucial that the girl was uh, a Native American. You know, what extent of, again, this uh, racist presupposition and so on, all this, all this implies. So, again, coming back to my main point, uh, I am aware of the immense tension here and danger of cultural imperialism, neocolonialism, and so on. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating an old story, but I am well aware of this danger from my old sources in ex-Yugoslavia. In ex Probably you know the story when in the early 90s in Bosnia, women, raped women, established some society association and some American feminists contacted them and People still laugh about it, even now, 20 years later in Bosnia. I was told by some Bosnian friends. Because the activists uh, the, uh, uh, mocked how they got a letter from an American feminist group trying to establish contact. And the letter was so insensitive, like there were desperate women there, serially raped and so on. And the questions that the Americans addressed to them was, I'm not kidding, like the first question was like a vulgarized Judith Butler question. Like, do you think that women have an eternal feminine essence? Or do you think that, that woman's identity is the result of performatively enacted uh, practices of repetition? You know, like the women just uh, look there. Of course, these are incidentally, theoretically pertinent questions, but I claim to put it in this way, it's just beyond description for me. So I am well aware how the immediate export of Western feminism and individual human rights can serve as a tool of ideological economic neocolonialism. But at the same time, I claim that, and it's quite incredible how up to a point as a reaction to the latest gains in, you know, gay marriages, abortions, and so on, we have this, as it were, sexual difference counter-revolution. It's not just Boko Haram, it's, uh, it's not just Mugabe against gays, it's even Putin. You remember, I know I mentioned it here, that story when that Austrian transvestite Conchita Wurst, I, it's disgusting, I don't like it, but when she won Eurovision, there was an incredible campaign in Russian media claiming, ah, is this new Europe, a, a, a bearded woman? And then with open, like even Putin said somewhere that, uh, I thought in the Bible it says that there are women and men. 
what entity is this now and so on and so on. So this recourse to to this recourse to sexual difference and the whole art of politics. I claim that's all I'm saying is to is to is to bring these struggles somehow together. What I I mean I know that we should avoid our Western anti sorry feminism. The point is avoid in the sense of not simply directly mechanically applying it to it. But uh, I don't accept the logic of now it's a big battle, for example, for human, no, for, for, for refugees and so on and so on. So let's not mention that now. The strategy should be to even reject the idea that there is a competition between the two of them. It should be somehow done as part of the same struggle. If we don't do it, then we, we run the danger of what happened a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember it, when a, a right-wing populist, Pim Fortuyn, was killed. But he was an interesting populist. He was what I'm almost tempted to call a politically correct populist. He was anti-immigrant, but his activity was, uh, he was openly gay, and his activity was precisely a kind of a politically correct rejection of Muslims. Because unfortunately, some Muslims in, in uh, Holland, in Netherlands, were effectively attacking gays. And you know, he succeeded to mobilize gays and feminists on anti-immigrant base. So I only claim, all I claim is that this is effectively a, 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 a complex situation and that you cannot resolve it in an easy way. Then let's go on. My God, this was meant to be a short introduction, but uh, <laughs> let me go on. Okay, let me, I want to do something about divine violence. I don't have time now. I will try to cut it short because I will talk about this in Ramallah next week. My idea is that I tried to locate what, uh, what happens now with these latest attacks with knives in Israel. I in no way agree with them. But one has to say a couple of things. And my source here is not some Al-Qaeda information service. It's simply whatever there remains of half-honest Israeli press, Haaretz, and so on. Even in New York Times, you find here and there news about this. But do you know that there is, it's not only that Palestinians out of despair attack with knives, Israelis, I mean, Jews in Israel, Palestinians are also Israelis, many of them, and then, of course, understandably, Israeli uh, Jewish counterattack. What about not just passive bureaucratic harassment, but the level of violence on the West Bank? Nobody talks about this. My God, it's daily violence. Like, you know that every year when there is a season of uh, harvest season, Settlers are burning, uh, are burning uh, olive trees, they are poisoning wells of water, even burning mosques, killings go on regularly. For example, recently I think there was some trial in Israel where they even know who were settlers who burned some Palestinian family and somehow they squeezed it, nothing happens. They found a way out and so on and so on. So again, the first thing to reject is that Israelis just want peace. First, I would say, of course, Israelis want peace. My God, in the same way that Germans, when they occupied France, they wanted peace. Every occupying force wants peace because it, it, it got what it wanted. So peace means we, the world, but even this is not true. I mean, it's not, it's not, the, the Israeli image is, it's peace then, Israeli provocations, sorry, Palestinian provocations trigger our retaliation. No, it's not that. It's 
permanent violence there. But what interests me is this, and this is a thing that I really uh, find sad. How, what is now happening with these knife attacks is effectively close to something that Walter Benjamin calls divine violence. And he defines it in a, in a very precise way. He defines divine violence as violence, which is, I quote, Benjamin, not related as a means to a preconceived end. It is not a means, but a manifestation. So again, divine violence is not what we, for Benjamin, is not what we today call religious violence uh, justified by some fundamentalism. No, because that is still instrumental violence. You do this to terrorize the enemy, to achieve a certain goal or whatever. But uh, for this is where, incidentally, in his attack on me, I claim Simon Critchley totally misreads Benjamin, where he reads divine violence in the sense of kind of a desperate strategy, like some t although we should reject violence, but sometimes when there really is no other way in order to achieve your goal, freedom, you have to do a little bit of violence. No, this is exactly what Benjamin does not mean. He means violence, which is like a manifestation of rage, without any strategic or whatever instrumental justification. And my Palestinian, and uh -huh, there is another tendency with Benjamin. I li like to smash it because, uh, you know, Benjamin is today a good guy, untouchable. So the problem for those politically correct uh, Western liberal friends of Benjamin is how to neutralize divine violence, how to make it some kind of a sublime symbolic gesture, nobody is really hurt and so on. So, no, 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 sorry, Benjamin is already, from the examples that he quotes in his Critique of Violence short early text, it's clear what he means. And my friend Sami Katib, Palestinian specialist of Benjamin, the organizer of that conference, found in a, a friend of Benjamin, Werner Kraft, in Werner Kraft's diary, an entry from May 20th, 1934, where Kraft reports on his conversation with Benjamin. He's asking Benjamin how he relates today, more than a decade later, to his notion of divine violence, critique of violence. Look what Benjamin answered. Quote, a just right, it's gerechtest recht, uh, a just right, is what serves the oppressed in class struggle. Class struggle is the center of all philosophical questions, including the highest ones. What he, Benjamin, earlier called divine violence was an empty spot, a liminal notion, a relative idea. Now he knows that it is class struggle. Violence, which is justified, has nothing to do with a sanction. It doesn't add anything to the thing. It is without a sensible image, like, for example, the crown of a king and so on. One can kill when one does it in this way, like one kills an ox in a slaughterhouse. The just war at the end of the article on violence, class struggle, and so on and so on. So whatever you say, Benjamin wasn't gentle here. He really meant violence. He didn't mean some sublime gesture of a great nowhere, we all cry in solidarity and so on. So how to read it? Here I am, uh, 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 I will, and then I will of course immediately answer to your counter question, but, uh, but uh, uh, my uh, reaction here is first that, yes, we do have examples of divine violence today. There were elements of it, and I hear uh, uh, correcting my false judgment. You remember that riots in the UK a couple of years ago, and I wrote a text with which I no longer agree, where I accused them of 
consumerist riots. Just, uh, no, I think it may be closer to divine violence. Or especially years ago, you remember those cars burning in the suburbs of Paris. What was so mysterious, it feeds Benjamin. It was just a manifestation of rage. It didn't have any clear goal. First, they thought it's Islamism. No, it was not. The first thing that protesters in Paris suburb burned were their own mosques, cultural centers, and so on and so on, cars. They didn't have any program, and so on and so on. And I think it's similar with these knife attacks in Israel. There is no, there is no secret terrorist political program behind it, and so on. It's just a manifestation of zero level, let's call it manifestation of rage. And now comes the crucial point, at least for me. You will ask, tell me, but nonetheless, we should be opposed to it. Here I, in a non, it's not justice. Uh, here, maybe you'll be surprised by my, pos by my position. In some sense, of course, we should oppose it. Like, fuck you, if I were to find myself threatened by a crazy mob, I would probably run away like hell or even shoot back. But you see the fine point. But nonetheless, I have no right to simply condemn them. That's crucial. It's the same problem as my friend, maybe you know the story, I'm sorry, Tom Mitchell, critical inquiry guy, told me he had this problem. He lives in that wealthy area uh, south of Chicago, University of Chicago campus, and north from the campus is a black ghetto. Uh, Louis Farrakhan lives there, and uh, uh, Muslim blacks, and so on. So he wanted to be politically correct, and he sent his son to a high school on the borderline between uh, uh, college area and ghetto. And then after three, four weeks, he didn't know what to do. His son came home at least twice a week without, uh, uh, with a broken nose, without a tooth, and so on and so on. And he saw the problem. The problem is that on the one hand, of course, it would be crazy to demand of him, no, you should sacrifice your son for a higher solidarity with the blacks, and so on. So, of course, as an individual, you protect your son. But at the same time, and that's crucial, you have no right to simply condemn the blacks. This is also for me an aspect of divine violence. You should rather ask yourself, and this divine violence, so that you will not misunderstand me, in no way I do think that terrorist attacks are divine violence. No, 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 they are not just a manifestation. I'm not in any way justifying them. We should condemn them. But with these desperate acts, like uh, attack with knives, listen, you cannot justify it, and nobody even tries to justify them it, with, through some political strategy, fear, and so on, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Palestine, uh, fear, uh, installing fear into Israelis. They all know, if you ask them, that it's a desperate strategy of... Uh, it's a desperate strategy which is just a manifestation of rage. And uh, we have no right to simply condemn it. And you will say, but then what to do? You have to fight it if you are caught in it. I mean, you will not say there, please kill me, yes, we historically wronged you or whatever. But that's the, that's the authentic historical tragedy for me. You know, that, that's our contradiction, us, of white men. Of course, physically, you protect yourself. But at the same time, you have no right to dismiss the violence which you suffered as simple injustice of a monstrous other, and so on and so on. You should rather question what kind of a society is this where the only way to articulate, not even articulate, express your Rage is through this type of uh, divine violence. I will just go, if I can, uh, a little bit further. Okay, I will do a short report on what I wanted to say, but I didn't. Uh, recently, something wonderful happened. Uh, uh, 
it was reported, I know it was a hoax, then on September 7th, Sarah Palin gave an interview to Fox News where she told the interviewer, quote, I love immigrants, but like Donald Trump, I just think we have too darn many in this country. Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, they are changing up the cultural mix in the United States. I think we should go home, we should go to some of these people and just ask them, would you mind going home? Would you mind giving us our country back? Then, this guy, Steve Ducey, tell, told her, Sarah, you know I love you, and I think it's a great idea with regard to Mexicans, but where are the Native Americans supposed to go? They don't really have a place to go back to, do they? Sarah replied, well, I think they should, because they are called, remember, Native Americans, I think, I think they should go back to Nativia or whatever they come from. <laughs> The liberal media treats Native Americans like they are gods, as if they have just have some sort of automatic right to be in this country. But I say if they can't learn to get off those horses and start speaking American, then they should be sent home to Nativia too. Now, of course, it's too beautiful to be true. It was an intelligent hoax. But I claim it, this hoax is a reality. It was a reality, maybe also somewhere else. It was a reality up to a point in Canada, where they constituted these reservations as their version of Nativia. Nativias exist. Maybe Sarah Palin is a hoax, but reality is not. And the greatest example of Nativia is, of course, where Bantu stands in the apartheid South Africa. You know, remember what madness were Bantu stands. The South African government selected, picked, I think, around 30% of the worst country, no minerals, uh, fertile, and simply in f they made them pseudo-autonomous sovereign states and informed the black people, this is your true home, you are from there. And uh, this is a wonderful mixture of this postmodern contingency, everything is constructed, and the rudest not. Can you imagine a black person who lives from times immemorial, his family, I don't know, were in Johannesburg, and then he is informed, cuckoo, good news, we found your real home, you come from that, and he goes there, it's just dessert, nothing, and so on, and so on. And I claim that if you read, Netanyahu's speech, where he described his position for the two-state solution, is basically Bantustans, no? What he is ready, but even that will not be the case, is to take some isolated parts of the West Bank, which will be totally controlled by, by, by the Israeli army, and give them this type of, uh, this type of uh, mock autonomy or whatever. But now, the last point, which, again, I think... Uh, is uh, crucial to say. Maybe with this I will conclude and we go tomorrow into death drive uh, and so on. Concerning the refugees. Now this is consciously problematic, but believe me, I mean it in an extremely positive way. I'm sick and tired of this postmodern narrativization which basically tells the following story immigrants or the poor, the other. They are good people, you just have to listen to their story, to learn to listen to them, and so on. You have to understand them. And then you will see they are humans like us. I'm totally opposed to this. You know why? And I even, oh, this is positive phenomenon. I read in Guardian or where, that now with some Syrian families in Glasgow or where somewhere in Scotland, that they are doing this, uh, organizing meetings, six families and, you know, of Syrians. Okay, it works, but I warn you, it works only up to the certain point. My point is the following one, which was masterfully formulated long ago by some leftist critic of Frank Capra films, you know, these pseudo-leftist uh, dramas, melodramas about the poor people, 
which all had this patronizing attitude. The poor people are wonderful human beings. You just have to understand them, open your heart to them. And then this cynical, wonderful leftist, I forgot who he was, theorist, said, okay, but then uh, what if you discover that they are not like you, that they are really not like you, then you can kill them or whatever. And my point here is the following one, that class differences, even cultural differences, are real differences. It's not, you know, that, oh, we just have to open our heart to the other and we discover we are all the same people and so on and so on. First, I want to repeat the old point that I already made a couple of times here about the most disgusting wisdom that I know is the wisdom of an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. Like, you know, you fetishize the enemy. No, I totally opposed to it. Just think about it. So it's good to learn. Hitler was our enemy because, you know, we didn't open ourselves to hear his side of the story about <laughs> anti-Semitism, maybe. No, it's not only that if you hear his story, it's a pretty disgusting story. It's, the situation is even more tricky. I don't think the truth of Hitler is the story he was telling. The truth of Hitler was the horrors he was doing. And I don't think, I mean, for every crime that you do, you can construct a wonderful story. For every killing you do, you can construct a wonderful narrative of how you are really, I don't know what, protecting the larger human rights and so on and so on. So it's not only that there are stories which, if you understand the other story, he's even more your enemy. It's simply that, the, the, this, you know, when somebody opens up himself or herself or themselves to you, it's not the truth. It's not the truth. Like, just think about classical example, oppression of women. No good patriarchal master will tell you, I'm oppressing women, but whatever, you know the bullshit. I'm protecting them from the evils of the world. It's me who is the real victim, by, and so on, and so on, whatever. So, uh, again, I don't think that this inner experience is the moment of truth. No, it's the fundamental lie. We are telling stories to somehow justify if we are doing it, the horrors that we are doing. That's why I also, I know you are uh, nervous, but give me five minutes. I'm more nervous, but I'm going to come and open up in a minute and respond to some of the things you said. I knew this, that's why I said this. No, but just a point more. For example, this is why I reject this, we are all humans beneath our skin. When I was in Israel, maybe you again know the story, a horrible thing happened for me. A special Israeli unit entered a house, a Palestinian house, looking for the father of the family who was allegedly a terrorist. And then there, was, there were only mother and some children in the apartment. And of course, they were all in a panic because military special police brutally entered the house. And mother called a daughter who was crying, come here, come here, and her name. And one of the attackers, Israeli soldiers, discovered that that girl has the same name as his own daughter. And he stepped forward and showed to the mother, you know, you see my daughter, oh, we have the same daughter. I found this the most disgusting thing you can imagine. Like, oh, we maybe, maybe we are attacking you now, but deep in we are, and so on and so on. No, I think the true respect for immigrants is I respect you even if I don't accept your story. I don't think we should patronize them into this ridiculous... No, of course there are rapists among them. But there are rapists, rapists among us and so on. Maybe we will never understand each other. But I don't want to live in a society where we understand everyone and so on. The true respect is the respect for the radical other whom you don't understand. And this is, I think, absolutely crucial. That's the true acceptance of immigrants. That, you know, we need superficial rules, cliches of tolerance and so on, even if, even if we do not understand, uh, even if we do not understand uh, each 
other. And again, I think that, again, I don't have time. Okay, now at some point I have to, to, I have to stop, but it's so sad because I have to stop. Okay, I will stop. But I, you, see, you see my point. I think that if we play this hermeneutic game of understanding and so on and so on, it's wrong. The only understanding... Can, so we cannot talk with them, we can, but I repeat my old story. The only chance of understanding is struggle. Not struggle with them, but we share the same struggle. That's the understanding. Otherwise, we are in this shitty UNESCO territory. You know, those disgusting UNESCO books. All human cultures are great. This culture, that... No. The, the, our answer to clash of civilizations should not be mutual understanding of civilizations, but there is clash within each civilization. And to bring together in a line these clashes. Sorry. I right. No, it was not so great. Now I, uh, you, were, I know what you were doing symbolically when I was talking. You were sharpening your knife there. No. I was. So now attack. Yeah.